The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at www.dallasgenealogy.org. Hi, this is Tony Hansen, webmaster for the Dallas Genealogical Society and the guy who forgot to start the recording in time for you to hear Anne's announcements. So instead of hearing her lovely voice, you're going to have to put up with me for a couple of slides. So you're about to see the German Genealogy Group meeting held on Saturday, January 18th, 2020. I want to make sure that everybody knows that the next three meetings are going to be held in a different room at the library. So we'll still be at the Dallas Public Library, but the, the March, May, and September meetings are going to be on the seventh floor in the Stone Room. And then November on the seventh, we'll pick back up again on the uh, fifth floor in the Heyman Room, where we have already engaged a, a very um, entertaining speaker, Uta Melhorn, who I know as a translator and who is also quite an experienced German researcher, so you want to be sure and make that meeting as well. The Dallas Genealogical Society did just donate a number of books to the genealogy section of the Dallas Public Library, including these titles on uh, German topics that should be of interest to anybody in this group, so be sure and check those out up on the 8th floor. There are a couple of free webinars coming. The Family Tree Webinars is offering uh, some free stuff on May 12th on leveraging my heritage's German resources effectively, and on May 19th, uh, Discover the Holding of German Archives by Teresa Steinkamp McMillan. So if you're available, those are great opportunities to pick up some more knowledge about German research. And if you're able to, I would strongly encourage you to try to attend the International German Genealogy Conference that's coming up in 2021. It'll be held July, 18, July 16th through 18th. And if you're at all interested in perhaps being a speaker, they are soliciting proposals. They have a, a call for proposals out right now that ends February 29th. And then there's some other dates up there about when you can get discounted hotels and early conference registration and things like that. So. Um, Ann and I, in fact, that's where we met. It was at this conference in California last year. Uh, I've attended uh, both the one last year and the previous one, and they're a wonderful opportunity to learn. So I would encourage you to try to attend in any way if you possibly can. And now we're going to join the presentation in progress with Bernard Meisner speaking. As a part of something or whatever, you can always go back to the website and get access. So uh, the previous meeting recording is there, and there are the handouts. Thank you for reminding me to start the recording. <laughs> okay, again, I'm Bernard Meissner, co-leader of the group. And as Ann mentioned, we are looking for a couple more folks to volunteer, even to do things like here in the front of the room, we need a person that monitors the chat. And all you folks out there on the internet, if you have questions or whatever, we're watching that. So feel free to type in questions. Uh, as they arise. And of course, we have Tony, and if you were here in the room, you saw the staff of the library to get all the technology working on this as well. Uh, I'm three eighths German. Uh, last name is Meissner, and that's the one set of ancestors I have been able to trace back to Germany. We're all from Northwest Bavaria. Uh, I'll talk probably a later meeting a bit about recently in November, I hired a professional genealogist in Germany because the records I wanted are in the Würzburg diocesan archive. They are not on the internet. Not all the records are on the internet. They never ever will be all on the internet. So there are times when you have to either go to an archive or have someone go to do the research for you. Uh, I had basic information he was able to extend me back to my fourth great grandparents uh, the records of course are in german i took german in high school and german in college and forgot most of it along the way although the genes are still there and i've been able to translate those records myself even the old writing and the printing even when stuff leads through from the other side of the page and I put all that up on Ancestry and got a link to a possible parent. And it's a Gephardt Meissner, apparently in Germany, who is descended from another branch of the family, but he has taken the records back to my ninth great grandparents. Uh, Johann Meissner was born in 1611. That's about the time Galileo was fighting with the Pope about did the earth go around the sun or the sun go around the earth? just to put that in context. And Gephardt said he used the church records but doesn't have them explicitly on Ancestry. So I will be contacting with my researcher again in Bavaria to go back and get those records for me. Uh, 
So just the way that once, once you get back and you start to get into the records, there is the potential, even with all the, the wars and destruction and whatever, to potentially get back, as I did, to the 1600s, sometimes even the 1500s. So the potential is there. You'll never get back to Adam and Eve. Okay, uh, what I'll be talking about today is looking at the various waves of German immigrants. Again, we're looking at everything essentially from 1700s up to the 2000s. And you can sort of group these immigrants into a couple of different time periods in looking at in terms of what the pushes were over in Europe, what the pulls were here in the United States. And I'll point you a little bit at some of the records you can potentially be looking for if you have ancestors that came during one of those periods. Uh, and again, there is a handout available on the website. I think it ended up 11 pages long, and I could have gone even more. So, but that hopefully will help you a lot, not just with references. Uh, the handout that's here in the room is the one Anne did. She'll be talking a little bit about the church records. But you don't have hard copies here unless you went to the website and printed one out before you came. It is available there. Uh, I direct you to that. And this talk, I'll probably expand into an hour long talk again with our November meeting. As Ann mentioned, we're shift around the Texas State Genealogical Society. We'll be here the second weekend in November. And I'm going to submit this topic as one of the potential talks that I may give. Okay, the first wave, I decided to stick it all the way back to Jamestown. So really 1683, rather than 1700 to 1820. And again, depending on where you read, the dates can be a little bit flexible one way or another. But there's about 300,000 German speaking people that came to what is now the United States. At that time, it was the colonies, uh, early on at least. And well, that was not the big number, we'll see later on, millions, of course, came. They had the head start. So they've been here longest. So in terms of the current people here, they have lots and lots and lots of descendants because they had a head start of a couple of generations to go. Uh, the pushes in Europe, there was a lot of religious persecution going on, particularly following the Thirty Years' War, which was 1618, 1648. Uh, lots of economic hardship because of all these wars. The rulers were then imposing more and more taxes to pay for the wars. And to some extent, there was some overpopulation. And in particular, the winter of 1709 to 1710 was really extremely cold. The Rhine River froze. So all the mills that ground the flour couldn't turn and grind flour. And they talked about the so-called Cold, the birds were actually just falling off the tree dead frozen. So it was an extremely severe time. At the same time, uh, William Penn had already come over to Europe looking to recruit people. In the case of the colonies, they were looking for more people. They were looking for settlers to come. And uh, of course, he was Quaker. And they were looking for German-speaking congregations and usually these were dissenters. They were not the Catholics or the Lutherans, which were the two big religions, and depending back then, who the leader of your principality, kingdom, whatever it was, they picked the religion, and everybody was sort of supposed to go that way, but that was the, the main choices at that time. Also, in the colonies, again, they were looking for people to come to work the lands, uh, in the case of New York, they were thinking about having them do some naval stores or like the, the pitch that they would put between the planks to keep the ship's water tight. Uh, mine silver, and then when they couldn't find the silver, they got iron, as in Virginia. And then, of course, you still had all the Native Americans that in most colonies were not terribly happy about all these British settlers coming in and taking over the land. So they decided, well, let's put some folks in between us and them as be sort of the buffer. Who came? Uh, most of them came, or a number of them came from the Palatine or Württemberg regions along the Rhine River. So it's really sort of southwest Germany, what we think of as Germany now. And because at least some of the first batch were from the Palatines, and there was no Germany at that time. Remember, this is 
long before Germany was really in 1870. So everybody here in the colonies was just not calling them Germans, was calling them Palantines. So it doesn't necessarily mean they came from there, they were just German speaking. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, often they came in groups. They always have the case that you have individuals coming, you have groups coming, you have chain migration, somebody comes over and then sends for somebody else, whoever. In this case, this time period, is primarily groups, families, sometimes whole communities just decide to, to pick up and move. In most cases, they were so poor, they couldn't pay their passage. So what they arranged was, we will get on the ship, the ship will transport them to the colonies, and then they sort of put them up for auction in terms of who the landowners were in the states, the colonies at that time, who would be willing to pay for their passage. And then these redemptioners, as they were called, would then contract for three to seven years of their labor to pay back the price of the voyage. So it wasn't quite slavery. Uh, it was not an indenture. The British were using an indenture where it was contracted ahead of time. This was they came to the colonies, and that's where the, the matching came between who was going to be their employer and who wasn't. At the same time, as we mentioned, the Pennsylvania Dutch, Dutch was just a perversion of Deutsch, uh, came over from southwest Germany, but also Bohemia, what we think of as now part of Czechoslovakia, Moravia, and Switzerland. And a little bit later, Pennsylvania and then Georgia became home for Lutheran refugees who were thrown out of the Catholic provinces and Catholics who were thrown out of the Lutheran provinces. So there's a lot of German discrimination going on and the colonies were saying, oh, come on over. And you've always probably heard somewhere in your history about the Hessian soldiers. The British didn't have a big enough army to really prosecute the war in the colonies so they contracted with some of the German princes. And uh, remember, if you've been watching the TV series Victoria, remember the king and queen of England were German. Uh, and they had contacts with German, all the royalty in there were intermarrying. So they sort of contracted with the Germans to bring in soldiers, many of which were draftees, not volunteers. Uh, a number of them died in the war, either of illness or injuries, but a number of them, they were pretty poor, got drafted, weren't too happy about going home after the war, so they decided to just stay in the colonies. So again, here, just in sort of map form, you can see the earliest one is Jamestown. There were a couple unnamed glassmakers and carpenters. They came in, and it's not even clear from the records that they survived the first winter. Then the first considered official German settlement in the colonies was just outside of Philadelphia. This is again because William Penn uh, set up Germantown and they came from Crefield, you can see there in Western Germany. Then one of the first groups of the Palatines that came over, uh, and again, they were all coming down the Rhine River in the tributaries. That was the mode of travel and Rotterdam was the port from which they sailed, in most cases, they went first to London because it's sort of history repeating itself in ways. The rumors were going around that Queen Anne, who was the Queen of England at the time, if you got to London, she would pay your way to the colony. So there's thousands of these Germans were all showing up just outside London, and then they had to really do, they have to feed them and house them, and they finally decided, okay, we can send some to the colonies, and some survived, the passages were really bad at that time, typhus, smallpox, illnesses were all around. And they decided to send a few to Ireland, because there were way too many Catholics in Ireland and the British wanted to get more Protestants there. Any of the Catholics that showed up from Germany, they just turned around and sent them back, because they wanted good Protestants after Henry VIII. So a number of them, did make it into upstate New York. And again, they were hired to produce naval stores. There's an old Jimmy Stewart black and white movie about these folks and their involvement in the French and Indian War, which came 
about 20, 30 years after this settlement. In Virginia, there was a landowner and essentially sort of the more people you brought over, the thing called head rights, you could get more and more land. And this was back at the time where people still you know, had the idea they wanted to be princes or whatever and have their own little principality in the colonies if they couldn't have one in Europe. And he brought over initially 18 families in 1714. Again, the original idea, he thought they could mine for silver and again be between them and the Native Americans. They didn't really find the silver, so then they switched over to doing iron mining and brought a few more from a little bit further south of Germany. But now it's estimated about 100,000 American, Canadians, Australians all can trace their ancestry back to the folks in Germana. It's a combination of Germany and Queen Anne is how they named the town. And there's a foundation and a website for all these early ones that were keeping the records. And that's the best place to sort of go. The research has been done. There was also advertisements in Louisiana, which at this time was French, and they were advertising for folks to come and live upriver of New Orleans. And it was called the German Coast. And there were quite a number again, and most of these were coming from Southwest Germany. And then in the case of the, the German, or the, excuse me, the Georgia, they were looking at folks from Salzburg, Austria, again, who had been evicted because of religious persecution, and some of the Swabians and the Swiss, which were just a little bit further south from the Palatines, and they came over as well. And again, you can find references to the Germans of colonial Georgia. So the first wave in terms of records, a lot of folks have documented this in terms of books and websites. Uh, and I have it in the handout. Hank Jones did a lot with the Palantines in particular. And he actually had a woman in Germany who apparently was very persistent in going to archives and parishes and talking to ministers and getting access to the records. So you have not only who they were in New York primarily, to some extent Pennsylvania for Hank, Hank Jones's books, but also where they came from in Germany. And then Anne Burkhardt, I forget her last name now, has about 20 books that she wrote of folks particularly settling in Pennsylvania. So a lot of these are in terms of check the books. A number of them are here in the library or some of the other local libraries. When you left Germany, if you were doing it officially and legally, you were supposed to fill out forms and get permission to leave. Uh, particularly, they were concerned if you were going to stay, you'd continue to pay taxes. If you left, you weren't paying taxes anymore. So they wanted you to pay the tax before you left. Uh, a number of people just sort of snuck out in the middle of the night. Uh, but perhaps your ancestors did, in fact, uh, leave some records behind there. Again, because they were coming in groups, if you can't find records about your particular ancestor to try to connect to Germany, look at the neighbors. Because often they came again from the same village or parish and see if you can track them back to Germany. And then once you get to that location, start looking at the records and maybe you can find your ancestors that way. The Redemptioners, again, that was a contract. So there are records of them. They were done in the civil courts. Uh, in some cases with the Quakers, they had their monthly meeting notes. And whenever somebody joined the congregation, that would be duly recorded. And if they then left to go elsewhere, that would be recorded as well. The Germans, of course, were not subject of the king, and particularly in New York and Pennsylvania, then they were required to take an oath of allegiance to the king, because they were now in the American colonies, and there are records of a number of those oaths of allegiance. So that may be, again, at least give you a name of a relative. As I mentioned back in Germany, there was a, essentially a 10% tax and ammunition fee for you to leave that you were supposed to pay. Some people did, some people didn't. So that was the first way. So these were mainly groups that came. Most of them were very poor. Some cases of religious persecution. A number of them became the redemptioners as well. And most of those records, again, you may not find actual document or records, but check for all these books that people have done the work or the websites for the various historical societies. 
So now we have the second wave starting about 1820. And in that wave going to about 1871 or thereabouts, probably about two and a half million German speaking folks came into the United States. You can see the big peak there is about 1850. And then of course it dropped off during the Civil War. You don't want to move to a place that's in the middle of a war. And then we started to pick up again a little bit after that. Uh, if you sort of look by about 1870, where were the Germans? And we'll see this will persist as a trend. They tended to stay up north. So they were coming in primarily to Philadelphia or New York. A number of them stayed in the cities, and that's what all those little circular dots are. But then the little smaller black areas as they were moving in to what would then been the Northwest Territories, now the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, and the like. And there's even talk of a German triangle, which was sort of Milwaukee to St. Louis to Cincinnati as a place where a number of the folks uh, did settle. You'll see those few down there near New Orleans. Uh, of course, by 1870, we had the Alzheimer's sign coming in to Texas. And in San Francisco, that's the gold rush. But those were mostly not people who came directly from Germany. Those are ones who had settled in the East Coast or even in South America, and then there's gold in California, so they hopped on the boats or the wagon train to head out that way. But that was not a direct immigration. Those were second and third generation Americans. Again, the ports of departure to sort of pay attention to. In the early days, it was Rotterdam, and again, that's because they were coming down the Rhine River, and that was the logical place to go. In some cases, then, as I mentioned, some went to London, in a few cases, they went across England to Liverpool and sailed from there. That was particularly in the early days. Uh, La Havre in the 1800s, particularly for southern Germany, and as you got later in the 1800s, you could even travel by train to get across. My Meissners from Bavaria sailed from La Havre. Then we have Bremen from about 1832. That was the, let's see, that's the Weser River, right? Uh, they would come from more central and even northwestern Germany. Uh, Bremerhaven is the actual physical port. Bremen is up the river a bit. And they actually had villages there where they had just so many people emigrating that they set up. They had lots of great passenger this, and they decided to destroy a lot of them. And then some that survived the more recent ones, a number were destroyed in the war. But as we'll see, some of the records have been recovered. And then Hamburg came in the latter half of the 1800s. Uh, this is the Elba River. But we'll see even the Germans from Russia ended up sailing from Hamburg. So that became one of the big ports. OK, for the second wave now, we're starting to get the Industrial Revolution coming in in terms of steam power, mechanical looms and the like, and uh, you know, they didn't have horse-drawn plows anymore. So a lot of the peasants were displaced. The artisans, again, there were machines doing a lot of the work, but they used to make things by hand. Uh, at the same time, agricultural production, more people were living, and they were starting to get rid of some of the diseases. So you had more and more people. And then you have the case, you're a farmer, you have your land that's big enough to support your family, but maybe you have six sons. What's going to happen when you die? In some places, the tradition was the oldest son would get most of the property, and then the second one becomes a priest, and then three, four, five, <laughs> good luck. In other cases, they said, no, you have to divide it among all your sons, and the farmer looked and said, very quickly, the farms will not be large enough to support a family. So it might be time to leave where there's more land, and that was the America. When the German Con Confederation was formed in 1815, one of the rights that was given to those who were citizens of the Confederation is you could move around a lot more easily as long as you didn't have any of those liabilities. So often you would have to advertise in the newspaper you were going to leave or something, but that was one of the other pushes. Again, as pools, what would bring them over, religious civil freedom, political security, economic opportunity. Uh, by this time, the first generations 
were writing back and saying, you know, it's a whole lot nicer here in Ohio than what we had in Hesse or whatever. And these were even published in the newspapers. And people said, no, oh, okay, yeah, remember the streets were all paved with gold. But not quite when they got here. There weren't that many other places that wanted German-speaking people. Russia was probably the one exception. So there weren't that many choices of where to go. And it became a business. So you had the shipping companies. You could decide they could make money moving people around. So all the shipping companies were advertising, recruiting, as well as some of the land companies in the States to sort of transport people through the port, ship them across, and then get them to transport to their final destination. So who all was coming in the second wave? It's both Catholics and Protestants. Uh, West Prussia, Pomerania, Posen, Bavaria, Saxony. Uh, and they became involved in any sort of labor you might think of. In the early days, they were building things like the Erie Canal and many other canals uh, before they had the railroads. And then once the railroads started building, then of course they needed lots of manpower as well. And these immigrants could be hired cheap. There was a big revolution in 1848 in Germany and the intellectuals then who were looking for a democratic utopia decided it's not gonna happen there. Maybe they could come to America and set up their own utopian colonies there. In, before the Civil War, there were a lot of independent craftsmen and farmers, again, coming with their families, so the whole family would immigrate as a group. And they were not poor like those original ones or the poor famine Irish. They actually had money. They had sold what they owned in Germany so that they could pay for the transport to get the train tickets to get to Ohio or Wisconsin or at some points even uh, Iowa and then get the farmland. I mentioned the German Triangle. You sure saw that on the map. Of course, here in Texas, we had the Alzerine, which was a group set up. And again, they were sort of, you know, wanted to be princes. They wanted to set up their own principality in Texas because they couldn't quite do one in Germany. So they sort of recruited people to come over. They were not experienced in setting up colonies and the like. Uh, once the, the folks got to Galveston or Indianola, they were supposed to have wagons to take them up to where the land they had got uh, from initially the Mexicans and then from the Texans. But at that time, the Mexican-American War broke out and all the wagoneers, the Teamsters, figured out they could make more money working for the military than they could hauling these folks. So they were sort of stranded on the coast and had to sort of walk their way in. Uh, so it was really hardship in the case of many of the cases of these people. The one grant they had is this Fisher Miller grant, 0.8 million acres. But you can see they sort of set up towns along the way because in most cases they were even sort of walking their way there. So we have things like uh, New Braunfels and Fredericksburg and the like is where they set up their settlements. After the Civil War, then industrialization really sort of expanded and you went from sailing ships that took weeks and weeks to get across to steamships that could make the trip from Europe to America in just a matter of days. And the shipping was a whole lot better and safer. Fewer people were dying in route. After 1871, that's when Germany, sort of Prussia, united all of Germany. Until that point, you know, you were a Bavarian or you were a Pomeranian, you weren't a German as such, and you sort of associated with your principality, kingdom, whatever the area you came from. And there were a number of different dialects of German. In the extreme cases, one settlement of Germans, and you tend to settle with your own people, and then there'd be another one up or down the river a little bit. And you sort of discovered you couldn't understand their German. In some cases, I read they actually end up speaking English to German-speaking groups because they couldn't understand the dialects. In the second wave, the people were leaving. They took one of three routes, as I mentioned, that come through Hamburg. This was particularly people from the east side of Germany. 
Bremen was sort of northwestern Germany and central Germany, and Lahar would be more the southern Germany. So if you know from which place they came, there's a chance you can sort of deduce at least what general area of Germany your ancestors may have come from. Another thing that sort of marks 1820, that's when they really started officially keeping passenger lists. That every ship was supposed to submit a list of all the passengers. There are passenger lists that predate that, but and you can find some of them, but they were not mandatory. There is in Bremerhaven a German immigration database, and they're trying to collect all the information of people who left Europe uh, from 1820 on. There's a set of books you've probably come across at one point or another, Germans to America. It has its strong points and its weak points. In the early days, they were just looking at ships that contain mostly Germans. So if it was 30% Germans, they didn't include them in the book. Uh, later on, they became a little bit more inclusive. So you may or may not find your ancestors listed in those. The original set started in 1850. My folks came over in 1846. Well, then they have an earlier set that now published from 1840 to 1850. And I saw they are, in fact, in there. I just found them in the actual passenger list when you search that way. It's a good place to start. And then the Immigrant Ships Transcribers Guild is another good source of looking. And you can search by port of embarkation as well. Again, remember, most of these lists were made in Europe as they were getting on the ship. It's not that they made lists in New York or Philadelphia or whatever. They weren't changing people's names in Ellis Island. Uh, and they have decided to change their names a little bit later, as we'll see in a bit. In Hamburg, after about 1850, they started keeping records of everybody who was coming through and leaving. Most of those records have survived. Yeah, it's estimated about 41% Germans and Eastern Europeans left through Bremen. 30% Hamburg, 16% Lahar, a few from Belgium, and fewer still from the Netherlands. A number of them did settle in urban areas, and by this time they're starting to do city directories. So that's another place to look to see if you can find your relatives. And again, pay attention to who their neighbors were, because their neighbors in the city may have been neighbors back in Europe. That was the second wave. Now as we look at the third wave, starting about 1871, up to about World War I. Uh, this is a map I found that sort of showed in 1900, they looked at the census and to see where did people say, from what country did they come? Again, you see a lot in the north where the predominance were Germans. Uh, you have to be a little careful in the south. Not that many Germans settled in the south. Uh, there was the whole issue of slavery and the fact they didn't need German laborers, they had imported ones from Africa. So it's a little bit of a misnomer in terms of how many folks that hadn't been there already many generations uh, in the South, but certainly up in the North, certainly going from Pennsylvania all the way across to Oregon is considered sort of now the German belt. Now we're up to about 4 million people. A lot of them, as you see, came in the sort of 1880s, and it dropped off a bit. And then as we got closer to the turn of the century, close to 100 years ago, the numbers dropped sort of substantially. Now in the northeastern part of Germany, what we normally think of as Prussia, as we identify as such, that had been rural a bit longer than places in the south, but now they were sort of losing out to the steam. And lo and behold, all the Germans who'd come to America were farmers producing all these great crops, they're shipping them back to Europe, and it was cheaper than buying it from their German cousins living there in Germany on the farms. Prussia, of course, introduced compulsory military service. Uh, there were lots of wars being fought. If you got involved in a war, you know, you'd either be killed or maimed or just die of illness it's in many, many cases. Bismarck was having a fight with the Pope about who controlled education, civil marriage, church appointments, and the like. Uh, so if you were Catholic, uh, 
it looked like this might be a good time to sort of go somewhere else. In Russia, in the early days, Catherine the Great and some of her successors, again, were trying to look for population, invited lots and lots and lots of Germans, went to Russia. They promised them free land, they wouldn't have to pay taxes, and they wouldn't be subject to a draft. So a lot went there. In the end, it was a very hazardous journey to get to the Volga or near the Black Sea. A number died along the way, but then they set up very productive settlements. And then later on in the 1870s, as the new czars came in, started looking at these successful Germans. And again, there were so many wars being fought, they needed more and more soldiers to decide, uh, we want your young sons, we want your crops. In some cases, if there were famines, they were even taking their seed corn. And then you couldn't even grow anything the next year. So for them, it was a good time. And we have here in Northeast Texas, there is another group of Russians from America. I met them briefly uh, at a conference that was up in Plano. Uh, they weren't quite aware of us, other than they saw the booth from the Dallas Library there, and I talked to them a bit. And we have the potential for collaboration with them. Again, immigration became less expensive and faster. The Homestead Act was passed in 1862, and you could come and settle the land, and it would be yours, make some improvements on it. Montana, New York, North Dakota, Colorado, Nebraska. And by about this point, the trains were about that far. They were laying the rails. Remember, 1876 was Custer and the Little Bighorn in Montana. So the settlements were just starting to move into places like Montana and the Dakotas. It was just a great land of opportunity. You could come and work hard and be a lot more successful. So in the 1880s in particular, we saw that big peak, about one and a half million Germans left. A number of them were just day laborers. They did come over just by themselves and just wanted to work. They may be that second, third, or fourth son who wasn't going to inherit any land. When the families came, uh, often it was a chain migration. The boys would come first, then send for a current or future bride, and the woman would come over to marry. And in some cases, some did go back to Germany. Again, they're coming from the rural areas in particular. The German Russians settled in the Great Plains from Oklahoma up into Canada, and they were in separate groups. Some were settling along the Volga River, I'll show you the map in a little bit, and they had Catholic settlements and Protestant settlements there, and they tended to move and stay as a group. So if you find your relatives in Iowa, look to see were they Catholic or Lutheran? Did they come from the Volga? Or did they come from the Black Sea? We had separate little groups. Here are the Volgan Catholics. Here are the Black Sea Catholics settled over here and the like. They did really intermingle as such. And again, they had been living in Russia. They sort of spoke a little bit of a different dialect as such. And in some cases, they couldn't even understand each other. And the Mennonites started to come in as well, and they're the ones that really introduced the wheat into Kansas. And you always think of Kansas now as growing all the wheat, thanks to the Germans that came from Russia. So there's the two places you can see the Volga there in the further east, and then along the Black Sea, they were sort of spread out a little bit more. And again, at this point, the transportation companies, you sort of bought a package tour, if you will, of the rail transportation, to get you off from the Humber, the ship that would get you to New York or Philadelphia, and then the train that would get you to the Dakotas or the like. You just bought the whole package. And they were making money from that, but that's how people travel. So even on the Black Sea, when you think, well, they could have gone down through the Mediterranean and across that way, no, they most likely went up to the Humber. We have all the passenger lists. Again, they were coming most at this time now was New York. Uh, originally, it was Castle Garden, and then that got overwhelmed, and Ellis Island opened up in 1898 and served there through certainly 1924. And as I mentioned, Hamburg then became sort of the chief port. If they applied for homestead to get the land that way, and that was one of the big draws, you had to apply for it, 
and those application papers have a lot of good genealogical information in them. Most states didn't require civil registration and usually until the 1900s. In Texas, they really didn't catch on. It was required early, but if you look at the history of Texas, about 1930, people really started registering births and marriages. But you can sometimes find records kept by locality. In the case of my Pittsburgh relatives, I discovered the archives of the University of Pittsburgh has birth and death records that go back into the 1870s, even though Pennsylvania didn't require it to 1906. So again, look around, learn about the, the area as well. Churches, of course, were recording baptism, marriages, and burials. Uh, and some, as I mentioned, like the Quakers, they would have their meetings in their meeting notes. They would have records of who came, who left. Prior to the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization being formed in 1906, again, if you wanted to be naturalized, you could go to uh, civil court, local or federal. But after 1906, it has to be a federal court. So again, you can find in many cases those declarations of intent and or their naturalization records in the courts. Again, a number of them you have to go to the, the court or have somebody go there. It's not all on the internet. Again, city directories were becoming more and more popular. They predated phone books, and they went every year and listed who lived there, what their occupation was, you know, where they lived. In some cases, they have what are now crisscross directories, where you could look by address as opposed to by name. So you could look up and down the street and see who my relatives might be. Uh, in the case of my cousin, his grandparents, they just lived up the street from each other. You, know, you had to be within kissing distance to find your mate and get married. So again, you can look around and always when you find one person in the records, you look around for others. Yeah, I mentioned the Hamburg passenger lists are available. It's the only one that really has completely preserved lists. And most of the departure lists will include where they came from, which is the key thing we're looking for, not only in Germany, many parts of Europe, because a lot of the records are local. And again, so many people were leaving through Hamburg because of the rail connections, in addition to the, the river, that you may find people from the East, Poland, Russian Empire, even some of the Scandinavians came through Hamburg. There are no lists during World War I, uh, they were sort of otherwise occupied during that time. In Bremen, again, all the older records, they just didn't have place to put them anywhere, so they got rid of them. They were not genealogies. They have found a number of handwritten cards, and those are now available on Ancestry and My Heritage from 1904 to 1914. And Bremen has been trying to combine, has the number lists as well from the 20s through the 40s that were sort of hidden away and were not lost in the bombing. And again, there's the Immigrant Ships Transcribers Guild. You go on their website and you can pick the, what port of departure as well, and they'll show you what ships they have. So that was the third wave, which gets us up to about 100 years ago. And now we're coming into after World War I. The numbers had dropped off already in the latter part of the 1800s. Uh, there were more and more immigrants coming into the country and people were getting concerned that there are just so many of them, and they weren't like us Americans who had been here for a while. Uh, like I say, history just repeats itself over and over again. So in 1921 and 24, they started passing quota acts in terms of how many people could come, and that substantially reduced the number. They were looking at who was already here in 1890 to 1900, which in many cases, were the Northern Europeans, like the Germans, as opposed to, say, Italians or Greeks. So there was a, at least a little bit of a bias towards having more Germans come. Uh, as the Nazis started to become popular in Germany, a number of the intellectuals and anyone of Jewish ancestry decided it was a good time to leave. After World War II, you know, Germany was substantially destroyed, overpopulation, of refugees that were coming in from the east, and well as all the food shortages and the like, 
Uh, so a lot of people wanted to leave. America, of course, didn't really suffer any destruction. And there was lots and lots of need for workers, all the factories so building, built up during the war. And now we're back to making goods. In the early part of this wave, in World War I, if you remember, women got the citizenship of whoever they married. So if an American married a Frenchman, they lost their American citizenship until 1922, and then they could sort of reapply. But at that time, the soldiers going over, and if they met someone in Europe and married, then those wives were automatically Americans. And they were a number of the war brides. And once they got paperwork, and they found a loophole in the law of how you could get an emergency passport issued in Europe, then they could come over. And the same was true in World War II, so the Congress passed some laws, even if they had the quotas, that allowed up to 20,000 German, mostly wives, a few husbands who had married American women. They were able to come. And then there was the Displaced Persons Act for all the refugees and decided they would allow up to 400,000 Europeans to come. Then 1965, they said, forget about the quotas, and we'll really focus more on shame migration. So we're reuniting families. So if it was a husband and wife, and they had children or parents that were in Europe, and then they were sort of given priority to come over. So some Germans were still coming, the immigrants were now more refugees, either before, during, after the war. Uh, certainly, World War I was probably the biggest concern about Germans. Like the really anti-German feeling became very, very high. This is where a lot of people changed their names. At some point, it became so extreme, I read, they were killing German shepherds and dogs. Killing the dogs because they had German names. Of their breed. So it was not a good time to be German. So a lot of folks then did change their names because of the anti German sentiment. And it was more so in World War I than World War II. So the immigrants, again, could be dissenters, Jews, others uncomfortable, uh, democratic minded politicians, science artists, and the like. Einstein came over. And then again, after 18, 1965, it was a uniting family. As I mentioned, before September 1922, and if an American soldier married a woman in Germany, she and any children they already had were American, and they could get an emergency passport. And those applications are at the National Archives. Then the U.S. Department of State has picked up anything from 1925 on, so that would include the war brides of World War II. And the visa files are now at the U.S. Citizen Immigration Services. And if you're watching the genealogical news, they have proposed substantially increasing the price and requesting those records to hundreds of dollars. So we'll have to see what the comments do with that. So now we end up with the German belt. While we have Germans in essentially every state, it's really sort of in the north, particularly sort of Pennsylvania across to Oregon is where you'll find the most German. Of course, we're down here in Texas, and some of them have been here a long time. I came here in 1979 as the first of my family. So we now have about 49 million people with German ancestry. That's about one sixth of the population. Not too many speak German anymore. And again, up to World War I, there were lots of German newspapers, German schools, German radio stations, and then no, uh, I don't think we're going to be German anymore. Thank you very much. So they Americanized in one way or another. So that's the waves of immigrants. Questions? Yes. Uh, comment on uh, the point of departure of American ancestry from North Carolina and how long the resident border. They left from Rotterdam. Uh, Rotterdam. Okay, so she's saying for the people online that 
Her ancestors were from Northwest Germany and came through Rotterdam. And among the records from Rotterdam itself are no longer available, but you can find records in, when they came into the States, uh, wherever they were landed in New York, Philadelphia. And again, I think the, the immigrant transcribers may have picked some of those up as well. Anything else? Just while we're changing speakers, I'm going to pass the sign-in sheet around for the people in the room. I'm going to do it again because there's a lot of people that I see that aren't checked in. So either check off your name or write it in if we don't have you on our list, please. Oh, never mind. Okay. Never mind. And, and everybody online, be sure you make you left your whole name so Tony can check you off after. What do you think? So we're going to totally change subjects, and we're going to talk about church records. And um, there's, there's a lot to this, so obviously not everything's online. <laughs> you hear that a lot today. So last time we talked about finding the town. So you found your town, but you still have to find your church record. So you have to find the church that the church records were in. That's the first step. Then uh, we're going to talk about the common four big ones, briefly. Uh, where church records can be found online. Then we'll talk about all the various archives and such where you might also find church records. So finding that church, you gotta find that church. So as you're looking in US records, let's say that you found a town. In this case, um, I had a German church in Illinois and I found in the German church, uh, my ancestors burial record and it gave a town. Well, unfortunately that is it the correct spelling of the town, right? And so it's like, okay, it's close, close. So it's a really good clue, but it's, it's not quite there yet. Now there's several ways to do this. First, I'm gonna tell you the family search way. And a lot of these uh, websites are all in the handout, so you don't have to worry about it. Now family search has a research places portion to their website. And so I could put wild cards in there. So in this case, I put an asterisk at the end of the first name, and then I put the second name, Feldberg, in Germany. Well, it turns out it was Warben D, Feldberg. So, so um, Family Search was able to pick it up, and there was one in Brandenburg and some in Mecklenburg, but luckily the record had said that it was Mecklenburg. So, okay, great, I found the town now, and I got the right spelling of the town, which is important. And in this particular case, it showed there was a Lutheran church there, and my family was Lutheran. So great, I've got some good information now to start with. Well, if you click on that, you can see you know, a map of the town, and you can even go into you know, the Google type map, but it no longer clicks you to the records. It used to, you can click on it and go to a record in the LDS church if it had a record for that location, but it no longer does that. So you still have to take that town now with the correct spelling and put it into the regular search engines for family search, okay? So that's one way you can do it. You can also take your town, uh, once you've found your town, and go up to the map guide to German parish record books that are upstairs in the library. Here and then, probably at some other libraries as well. So what you're going to be looking for is the names. So this gives the place names in about the 1870s. It'll also possibly give you some, some of the older church names and town names that no longer exist. Google Maps, by the way, some towns don't exist anymore, so can't really depend on that. Uh, it would give you the family history number and identify the church district. I'm going to talk about church districts a lot because this is really important to finding the church records. So you could do that. You could go upstairs and look at the set of books. That's another place you could go. Or you could go to the Myers Gaz online and do a lot of this all in one step. <laughs> this is my favorite place. In fact, if I type M in my browser, it goes here because I go <laughs> I go here all the time because of the different features that it has. And we'll talk about some of the different features as we go along. Now, one thing also to remember is some towns, like I have a town named Kaufmannhagen. Sometimes it's spelled with a C, sometimes it's spelled with a K. So watch the terms as you, as you do it as well, because it did change over time from a C to a K. 
So when I go, um, oops, not the wrong way. Here we go. So it looks like this. This is the easiest way. Now these records are organized and they have place names from about 1871 to 18, 1918, as this shows, but it does help you with even older names. And you can use the same wild cards you could use in family search here. So this is like an all-in-one site. We're gonna go through some example of one of the things that I did. So we talked about that, the woman a minute ago. Well, this is her husband. And her husband's burial record said that she lived in Magnumburg. Well, he's from Magnum, Magnumburg. But as a good genealogist, I don't stop with just the church records. I go look for immigration records. I look for all the different records on him, right? So I found a Hamburg ship record that gave a different town. It said uh, Neuenkirchen. Well, wait a minute. Those, this is confusing, right? Why was it giving a different town? So what happened was, I went back to the church. Well, I've, I've kind of already done this. When I look at a church record, I look for everybody with that surname in the church right away because it's going to come back, right? You're going to need that information. So it turned out there was another person with his last name in the church, and his record had said New Encurchin. Like, mm, I think I'm going to try New Encurchin. And so that's what I did. So I put it into Myers, and luckily it was spelled correctly, so I didn't have to worry about it too much. And I came up with 21 of them. That wasn't very helpful. <laughs> but that's what happens, right? So in some cases, you don't get one. In some cases, you get 21 of them. So one of the things I had to do is I had to do some additional thinking. Well, he came over, and within a year, he married his wife over in the United States. I'm going to try maybe to look where his wife was from. And she was from Mecklenburg, right? So I'm going to try to look to see if there was a new incursion near his wife's town. So I selected the region. You can see there's a region selection. And I got one, only one. All right, I'm going to try this church. This is the one I'm going to try. Now, if it didn't come up with anything, you can always do a sounds like. And I've had to do that occasionally where I've had a town that's just spelled so badly. I had to do a sounds like to try to figure out what the town name was. So when you click on this, in this case, it was a partial record. It had no map, no church listings, but it did say that it does, it did say that this one had an evangelical parish, the one that was in Mecklenburg. Okay. So I knew that I could look for this town. I knew that it was in Mecklenburg, so I at least had a place to look for the church now. It was my goal, to find, find the church. Where is the church? Now I'm going to look at a different entry in Myers to give you some other hints of things you can do with Myers. So in this case, I picked one of my other towns. This town had a bunch of stuff. And its, its entry was very long. And you see all the acronyms that are listed there. Well, if you scroll down, it's going to explain all the acronyms for you, which is wonderful, right? It tells you where the military district was. It tells you where the civil registration was and where the church is, right? All those wonderful things. Well, before this nice little website existed, this is what we had to do, right? I don't know how many of you had to do this, but I had to do this. You had to go to the original Myers or and you had to take and you had to translate all those acronyms and figure out what it said. And so that's why I have this page here because I had to do it for this church. I had to go and look through everything. But luckily, this website does it all for you in English, which is just so wonderful, okay? Now, uh, in this case, it says that the civil registration office was in this city. So that's great. I know it's all here in this town. I'm going to look at some of the other portions. I'm going to look at the ecclesiastical. I always have trouble saying it. And I could see that this town had a uh, Protestant parish right there. But there was another church. There's a couple other ones three miles away, etc. So why is this important? Because if you don't find, I have a lot of problems where you've got either the man married somebody and they married in some other church, but then they had the kids back in this church, right? So they married somewhere else. So you got to figure out what church they married in, where she was from. And so these other churches listed here are the towns I start looking at because she probably was pretty nearby, right? So I use this list all the time. 
that can give me ideas of what church to look in. This has the maps as well, and you can toggle, there's a little thing called toggle historical map here, and you can toggle, what I did was I clicked on Protestant churches, and it will show the Protestant churches in the area, and, and it also has all the little towns. So when you have a church record, it might say, well, they were really from Westwald. Well, where is Westwald? So you look at the Copenhagen map and you can see it. Or you can put in Westwald if there's 12 billion of them <laughs> um, and try to see where the village actually was, which is great. You can also toggle to Google Maps, although that hasn't been working for me this week. I don't know what's wrong with it right now, but it'll toggle to Google Maps too. Okay. Now, it does have errors. This particular town is a perfect example of a major error. This, this uh, particular town is two miles away from two different churches. So did they attend Hattendorf or did they attend Siegelhus? Well, it says they attended some bizarre church that is nowhere nearby, if you look at where the wrong box is there. What happened was there's many, many Langenfelds in Germany, and what they did was they put this on the wrong one. This box is on the wrong one. So I sent feedback in. It hasn't been corrected yet because they get a lot of feedback. But if you see something wrong, send in feedback, and they can try to fix it. Because there are errors. I found several errors throughout, throughout here, but it, but it still is really good as a help. So we find the church. So in this case, the primary church is usually listed first, so I'm going to guess it's Hattendorf, which it really is. But I'm also going to look in Siegelhorst because it's the same distance away from the town, right? So again, very good clues. All right. Now, uh, in James Beidler's book, Trace Your German Roots Online, there was a link on page 133 that no longer works. But it, so I can't tell you where this chart is, obviously, but um, this is very important for finding your church records. First of all, you have to know the political district in the different time periods. And you have to know out of the Catholic and Protestant, and where is the civil registration, because it's not always in that town. Now, <clears throat> the Myers Orst is kind of going to be the first, second boxes on here, if you will. But well, we're going to see that not all of the websites store their information based on Myers Ors. And also, I would even add a column to this because now the archives districts for Germany don't match what it was in 1945 either, of course. Okay. So we have um, Niederstaschen that didn't exist in 1946. Okay. So you've got all these different name changes. When it was Prussia, now it's, now it's Brandenburg, you know, et cetera. So you really got to understand where you're going to look. Because where is it today? Well, it's in the Niederstaschen archive. But where was it before? Well, it was Prussia or what, you know, whatever. So you've got to understand where it is in what records. All right, so now we know where the church is. So now we got to look at the church websites. So Family Church Search chose to use the myers Orst names, which is awesome, because once you find the name, you can plug it in there. And what happened was I took that Warbendy Feldberg, Germany, and I put that whole name into here, and it didn't find it. But then I just put Warbendy, and it found it. Don't ask me why. So anyway, <laughs> try it, and, and it will kind of match the names that you're going to find in Myers Ors. Well, that's great. Ancestry didn't use that. Of course not. Ancestry uses um, the, the towns about 1946 when they formed after World War II. That's where that chart comes in. You got to know where it is later on. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to look at Matricula, which is a little bit less used website. Again, these links are all in your handout. This one's free. And if you go to the lower left is where the switch over to English is on this page. For some reason, they put it down at the bottom on the left side. I don't know why. If you click on continue, you're going to get a book, a map, and a magnifying glass. I'm going to use the book today because it combines the map and the listing of churches. 
together, okay? And it's good to start with that probably. So here it lists the countries, and I didn't do a, a um, English conversion on this page, but you can probably guess pretty well. And it shows you real high level where the records are on the map. So you can see this quite a bit in Germany and other German speaking countries. Now I'm gonna click on Deutschland and I'm gonna get the archives where they got records from in Germany. And again, you can see about where the dots are. So you can also click and zoom on this map. So you can zoom in and kind of look as well. I put, picked Magneburg just because whatever. And uh, it gives you the list of churches. And again, you can zoom in and, and kind of figure out which ones are what. I just arbitrarily picked a church. And it looks something like this. Now, this is an international in your denominational, so they have some Lutheran records, they have some Catholic records, they have Jewish records. So at least look to see if your church is on here, okay? It's free. <laughs> okay, the other one is Archeon, and that's uh, trans the, the switching to English is at the upper right for this one. So we switch to English, and the first thing you're gonna wanna do is take your town name and put it in the search field. And the reason is because you can narrow down pretty quickly if they have a record for you or not. Because if they do, in this case, this town happened to have multiple locations in Germany. So as you can see, it was in Hessen, um, uh, Kurhessen, and Westfalen. There were names with this, that already have records online in Archean. Now what's important here is it gives you the church district. So I don't have to go upstairs to the books. So right here at the bottom of the arrow is uh, Kirchenkreis Bielfeld is the church district where that church is in. Let me write that down, because that's important to have the church district. <laughs> okay, now there's another, you can also then click right on it and it will take you to the records if you have um, a membership. But it will actually give you the list without a membership. So you can at least click on it and see what they have. But what I like to do is I like to use the browse feature. And in this case, I went to Westfallen, I went to the church district, and I went to the church, okay? And then I ran out of room on this to make it big enough for you to see, so I gotta go one more slide to get over to the right side of the page here. It gives you what's available for that church. And you, there's scroll bars that are kind of hard to see there. And every church is gonna have a different type of list. Some use the letter B for burial. Obviously, it's not burial, but they use the letter T for baptisms, TR, right? They use the acronyms instead of spelling it out like this website does. But some of them have family books. And the family books are awesome because it tells you, where, you know, who's all in the house and all that kind of wonderful stuff. And some of them even give you a map of the town that shows where the house numbers were. But that's not everybody, unfortunately. Now in this case, you're gonna find that most of the records cut off like this does in about 1890, especially the baptisms because it's 150 years, I believe, for baptisms. And so it cuts off about 1890 right now for the records here. But you can at least see if they have your town, if they have the record time frames that you want. So you purchase a subscription. Now there's some oddities. Everything has oddities in it. In this case, um, this is a different town. I went to Myersorce and it said, well, Hattendorf is the church that I need to go to. But when I look in Archeon, it has records for Antendorf. Well, how could that be? Well, they started in 1830. There's two possibilities. One, they built a church, which didn't happen. But in one of my cases, it did happen. They did build a church in that town. Or they started keeping records in, in record separate books because of the laws coming about of, of tracking civil registrations and things like that. They use church books sometimes. So they started separating it by town. So now they have a separate book starting in 1830 for this town. It's no longer under the other town records anymore. So you're thinking you have to look in Hattendorf, but you don't. And there's not gonna be a lot of clues that tell you 
Oh, by the way, it has a separate book. So look at for the actual town name besides the one that my resource said as well. Now I think you can get to this page, but you're going to need a subscription to view the images. But it also did tell me to go to Hattendorf to go look for the other records, which is helpful in this case. Okay. All right, so those are the basic four websites. So now we have a bunch of other places that we can look. So some of these websites were provided to me by um, a woman that uh, works at the Family History Center in Salt Lake City. She had talked at the last uh, International German Genealogy uh, Conference and on this subject. So some of her websites are in here and she gave me permission to use them. So some of the big portals like GenWiki, they have civil registrations and that links in your handout and they have parish records. Now another portal that isn't as well known probably is this Austrian portal. This Austrian portal does have German records. So if we go to the Austrian portal it, and change it to English, it looks something like this where you can click on Germany or some of the other countries. It has a lot of other countries where it points you or has the church records. Okay. So it leads to a place to look. Now in Germany, there's the overarching state and local archives portal. And it has a section, I don't know if you can see it's kind of small, where it says church archives. And you can click on that and it will give you a list of the archives that have church records. I'm going to talk about a few of them as we go through here and a few other obscure ones that you may not see on a state and local archive. So some of them that she mentioned uh, in her presentation was that these civil registrations for the East Western Lippe were being put on a website. Okay, those aren't on Archean, those are here. The Hessen State Archive was going to put them on Family Search and Ancestry, but they also have them at their website. And so not all of them have been put on Ancestry and Family Search. Okay. Again, depends on your region. This is state archives that we're looking at. Now the Baden-Württemberg State Archives, they have online parish registers organized by civil court district, not by church district, by civil court district. So where's that civil registration? Okay. And they're organized by Northern Baden, Southern Baden, excuse me, and Jewish. There's some Jewish records as well on their website. Cities archives actually have records. Cologne is one where they have some civil registrations online. And the small community of, of Romer Kirchen in Rhineland has posted some of their records. It just goes all over the place, right? All different levels. One of my berries is Northern Germany because they haven't put a lot online yet. There's an archive, an evangelical Lutheran archive, mind you. This is not Catholic, these are Lutheran records. And they have an archive, this is a Lutheran church archive, not a state archive, it's a Lutheran church archive, and there's a bunch of them online. Now they are digitizing and filming the records, but this, this one little problem. Their headquarters is in Kiel, and they have um, other archives in Schwerin and Griefswald. Well, unfortunately, the Griefswald archives is the one I need, right? Uh, they don't have a home right now, so they haven't started digitizing their records. Great, thank you. <laughs> but at least they have some things you can download. You can download, there's a thing, um, but there's two things you can click on, the Church District of Mecklenburg and the Pomeranian Church Records. And what it is, it's a list of towns and a list of dates that they have records for. So you can really see if the records exist in the time frame and what towns they have records for. So that's at least a little helpful. Okay. Um, Berlin has a state church archive, um, and it has like an, an overview, like a list of what they might have. But the central evangelical archives are putting their stuff on Archean. Okay, not all there yet, but they're working on it. 
There's an archive at Castle. Uh, West Prussia research, research website has church record locations. They're not online there for the West Prussia website. And Mecklenburg Western Pomerania, they don't have them online, but they have some good information if you want to write to the churches and things like that. What they have is this, there we go. There we go. This one, this one little page thing. It shows every church with a dot, and I can't see it this one, but um, there's three different regions, and it shows you exactly which archive it's out of and which churches exist today. So it's kind of handy if you have um, churches in that area. It gives you contact information for every one of those little churches and stuff. So that, that's kind of helpful. Uh, Niederstaschen includes Bremen, Bremen, and they have, again, a church book section where you can go and look at church books. I picked Hanover because I have a bazillion people in Hanover. Um, and so in Hanover, they have a name register from 1774 to 1874. Unfortunately, it's not online yet because there are over 8,000 pages of Meyer alone. It's her name Meyer alone. So they haven't gotten it all online yet, but they have it available to look at. They also are putting their stuff onto Archeon. So they have a page that talks about what's already on Archeon and what's not on Archeon, and, and it's getting there, okay? Now, one of the other uh, things, I'm not familiar with Eastern Europe as much, um, but this is from um, Baravel Johnson. Uh, we've got the shoebox and another Polish state archive and the Eastern European Genealogy Society and another link that you can try from that region if you have any Germans that are over in that area. Basically, you have to look everywhere. So I, I did some search terms as well. These are some of the terms that were used on the websites where you can kind of look at those search terms, put them into Google, and then put your area in, and it might help you find some information on it. I could not possibly put all the locations in this presentation, so this is a smattering of different ones. But look at the state level, looking even at the local level. And I didn't touch on genealogy societies very much, but there are genealogy societies that are gathering records as well. So just keep that in mind. Do you have something? Mm -hmm. uh, So, in, so the question was um, the Jewish records for what is now today Poland, and were they kept sometimes in Catholic records? And so I would go to let me go back one. I would go to some of these websites, and and look to see what they can do to help you for looking for the Jewish records. I'm not as familiar with that, I'm afraid, um, but these people should be able to help you a little bit with that. And that one um, Austrian website is it Austrian? Sometimes the Jewish records are available on some of the state archives and things like that, and the church archives listings, not the Lutheran archives. Listings, but yeah, so I would just kind of check those sources, unfortunately. Yep. You mentioned uh, uh, Jewish world to uh, migrant workers, uh, digitized workers, but what they do have digitized are the uh, Swedish language maps. Okay. And that is through the uh, 15th century, up to 1815. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that. So um, the Griswold records are, the church records themselves are not online, but the Swedish, ma Swedish maps. And what was the years for the Swedish maps? Do you have a year for the Swedish, Swedish, Swedish maps? Did you say what year? Time period. Did you say the time period was after the 15th century? 
1830 okay okay so they're, they're maps of the houses and the buildings from that time period and that's available on the your swall website no, the archive, okay. Okay. The Palmer and Archives? Okay. Uh, we don't exactly have a website for that, but we, you can look for them then. Okay, so this is Swedish. Um, plat maps, if you will, with houses and things like that available. Okay, for that area. Great. Okay. Um, so, first thing you have to do is to summarize is find the town that the church is in or where the civil reg registrations are. Go to the basic four websites and kind of look at those, see what they have, and then start digging around at your state and local and church archives. I should have said church archives in here as well um, because they might have something that's available as well. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, I think we're gonna call it a day. Thank you for coming. Okay, last call for questions from anybody out there virtually. I'm sorry? No, we have none. Okay. Thank you all for attending. Okay, thanks. And March went the other room. Right. Archer in four seven. <laughs>